So we're here at Natty Greens to do an interview for Well Crafted NC. You're one of the co-founders yep. of Natty Greens. So I'd like to start with having you tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay. Yeah. Well, my name's Kane Fisher, and I am one of the co-founders of Natty Greens Brewing Company. Um, I started it with Chris Lester. Uh, I'll give you a brief history uh, and our direct connection to UNCG because that's where we met in 1988. We became fast friends and roommates and we're working together and you know uh, like a lot of college kids had big big dreams um, and ours was really surrounded um, you know coming up with a coming up with a concept for a bar. We had no idea what that concept would be but we knew we wanted to do a bar probably for all the wrong reasons at that time. Um, but in 1989, we tried something that uh, was foreign to most people, and that was micro beer. And we loved it. We fell in love with it. So we dove in, and we really started uh, trying to learn more about it, where it was coming from. And we saw this, um, this huge following in Colorado, California, and the Midwest. And so what it really did was, it one, created a passion, but two, created a concept. that If our dream ever became a reality, um, we would open up a... American Micro Beer Draft House, which we did in 1996, right in the heart of UNCG's campus. Uh, it used to be Spring Garden Bar and Grill. We were able to secure that location, and we opened Old Town with the idea of having 17 American Micro Beers on draft, which was unheard of in 1996. Um, I mean, now you can go to places that have well over 200 taps, but in 96, 17 was aggressive. and not only aggressive in the number of taps, but the style of beer that we were trying to, um, you know, convey to, to, the, to the community. So we opened it, and there was some skepticism at first. Um, people, I think they thought it was a malt house. They weren't really sure what was going on with all these crazy tap markers and whatnot. But, um, you know, they soon uh, understood the, the kind of the micro beer um, uh, revolution that was to come full force in the state of North Carolina about 10 years later and so it led us to our second place in 98 we opened a smaller draft house in Winston-Salem called First Street Draft House came back um, to, North, uh, to North Carolina to Greensboro and uh, opened up Tap Room across town and that's when the industry um, and the community really truly started understanding microbeer so much so that it transitioned from microbeer to craft beer, handcrafted ales, handcrafted beer, uh, for short crafted, you know, craft beer. And so we saw this wave getting closer and closer to the East Coast. And so we said, you know, we've been serving all this great craft beer at our draft houses. We ought to, we ought to open our own, our own brewery, our own brew pub. And so that's when we dove in on that. So that's kind of how we got started. Um, I'll let some of your other questions lead and I can complete this story and tell you kind of where we're going and how the industry's changed quite a bit since we've gotten into it. Why did you choose to open a brewery in downtown Greensboro? So, perfect question um, to keep, keep the story going. So, we saw, the, the reason we decided to, to get into it is because, you know, we had you know, well, I told you created this passion for it, but we also just saw this movement. We saw this movement uh, that was happening throughout the country, and it was just getting closer and closer, and we just wanted to be a part of it. We had no idea where it would take us. We didn't care. We just liked it. Um, and so for us, the stars uh, were aligned perfectly. Downtown Greensboro was revitalizing itself. We're in about 2002. Um, this building that we're standing in right now, 13,000 square feet, uh, it was built in the 1890s, a lot of history to it, three levels, huge for our, you know, for what uh, we were used to. Our draft houses were about 20, or about 2,000 square feet, uh, and then we we're looking at 13,000, but we knew we needed about six to eight to house uh, brewing equipment and uh, all the manufacturing side. So. This building was perfect. It was on the corner here of McGee and Elm Street. And so we didn't do any demographics. We just saw a beautiful spot in a revitalizing, or at least a push to revitalize downtown Greensboro. And we wanted to be part of it just as much as we wanted to be part of the growing craft industry. We wanted to be part of uh, downtown's growth. Um, how has downtown changed since you opened in 2004? It's, it's changed drastically for, for the, the good of the community. You know. When we came down here, like I said, we, we weren't looking at, you know, are there residents here? Are there, is there any other retail? We, we were looking at, you know, 
continuing our dream, and we had the perfect location and um, you know uh, building to, to, to house that dream. And we just felt that if we can pull this off, more on the beer side, honestly, if we can get people to drink our beer, that means they're, they're coming down. Um, we did not know what to expect. We had very low projections because we did not know what to expect. And uh, when we opened the doors August 1st of 2004, uh, we were pleasantly surprised. There was about 250 people waiting outside the door before we opened. I only had enough food for about 100 people. So we ran out of food right around uh, 4 o'clock. But we were able to buffer everybody's angst because they couldn't eat with free beer. We said, well, you know what, we'll just sample our beer out because uh, we'll go ahead and get that in, in and it's got a little bit lower margin and we kind of screwed up, but we didn't know what to expect. So it, it, it exploded. So how has, how's it, how has it changed? Well, it started with a lot of interest and it was followed by a lot of uh, new residents and tenants. And so to the tune of now just about every one of these buildings that were empty in 2004 when we opened are either filled or they're claimed and they're going to be filled. So it's great. I mean, more the merrier. We're, we couldn't be more excited. What challenges did you face while you were opening this location? We are fortunate. Um, we didn't have to face too many challenges. I mean, you had to go through the, the normal licensing on the beer side and the uh, ABC side. But, you know, for us, it was, we were in, in, a, in a time when everybody was excited about something happening downtown. So for us, it wasn't a whole lot of challenges other than being able to put the food and the beer together. Because prior to opening this, uh, Chris and I traveled around. Uh, we did a little two and a half week road trip to just go see what was happening uh, on the East Coast, Southeast. And what we saw was we saw a lot of brew pubs closing down. And so when we looked into why they were closing down, the one thing that we noticed was they weren't putting it together and didn't have a balance. They were either really focused on the, the food. And it was almost high-end white tablecloth, and they didn't really care about the beer because they felt that, well, this is it's it's a niche, you know, that people are just going to come for anyways. Where, or, or they'd be the opposite: the beer was really good, and they didn't care about the food. And so, our experience through our draft house is we were able to, even though we weren't brewing beer, we brought the best quality beer that we possibly could get in, and we paired it with the best quality food that we could do. And so when we came here, our biggest challenge was to say, we need to make sure we have that perfect balance, and we achieve that. Can you tell me a little more about what it's like to operate a restaurant in addition to the brewery? Yeah. Um, for us, it was, it was natural because we had had, you know, if we had opened this place prior to Old Town, First Street, and Tap Room, I would have a different answer. But we had our four to six years of college you know, education leading up to this place. So it worked out perfect for us to have a lot of trial and error with Old Town. And that was kind of our, our, our training ground. And then when we went to First Street two years later, that was a little bit more honed in where we could, and then Tap Room was like just plugging a formula in. So we had that background, that basis going into this. So for us, it was just about Putting it, putting it together, but more on the beer side. We had the food side down, but we hadn't been brewing. We've been bringing in great beer. So what we wanted to make sure we did was have a world-class or a national-class brewer, which out of the gates, which we got from Colorado, from Left Hand Brewing Company. We collaborated on styles that we wanted to, to uh, get out there. We like sessionable-style ales for uh, many reasons. One, because we like to drink beer more than one. Also, we needed to bring people down here to, to have a couple without having you know, high ABVs. At that time, we weren't allowed to brew above 6% anyways. So our challenge was to just get the, get the beer right, get it consistent, and uh, it, it, it helped having a, a world-class brewer. What's it like to work in the craft brewing industry? I don't know anything else. I mean, on the restaurant side, and on the uh, on the brewing side, but um, it's fun, it's challenging, and it's also been um, a very unique uh, experience for us to be a part of something that has exploded 
like the dot com era. Like I never thought anything like that would ever happen again. And here we are, the craft industry is happening. We're part of it. So just to see all the changes in the amount of breweries that are out there, not only nationally but locally, but also just all the different styles and the experimentation. I mean, it's it's just a it's just a fun industry to work in because the crafting aspect of it. We can do whatever we want. You know, and now you know you're, you're expanding on just traditional styles. I don't even know if there's such a thing as traditional styles anymore. I think it's just all about exploration and having a good time, and we do. So you mentioned that the ABV that you're allowed mm-hmm. was increased. Mm-hmm. Um, how did that impact what kind of beer you made? Yeah, uh, pop the cap. That, that movement was called that. That got that taken care of. That opened the door for all the uh, experimentation and um, taking, taking those traditional styles and taking them to a whole new level and um, opening the doors to, it really opened the doors to more breweries. A lot of home brewers that were doing stuff that was well over 6% uh, decided that, well, hey, I can get into this now. Um, and then just styles uh, and, uh, that were never, we were never allowed to do, um, you know, it just opened the door for that. So it, it changed the game. It changed the game in North Carolina. Can you tell us about your new location in Revolution Mill? Yeah, so as the story progresses, you know, from 96 to today, um, the industry on the craft side especially has changed drastically. I mean, downtown Greensboro has changed, and so we've got more and more tenants and more and more residents. Well, the craft beer industry has changed. We've got more and more breweries. Um, and so there's been this, this hyper-local approach that you see, and you've seen this evolution and transition and expansions of all these other breweries. And so for us, um, when we opened our brewing facility in 2006 to get into the distribution side of things, we opened just a production facility. The game the, the, it was different then. The industry was different. It was more about just, we want craft beer. People wanted craft beer. They didn't care about the style. They didn't care where it was coming from. They just wanted craft beer. And so we kind of rode that wave uh, until about 2010-11 when the industry got what I call the Asheville effect. And the Asheville effect is that attachment brewery where you can actually go to the production facility but you can experience music and food and you can bring your, your, your dogs, you can bring your kids, you, you have a good time and you, you leave with an attachment to that specific location whether it's the city or that brewery. And so in about 2012, 2013 um, we, made, we started uh, putting the plans together to transition from just a production facility to more of that attachment uh, facility. And so we looked around and we did our due diligence and for, you know, we we're flattered other, other cities were looking out. So we just kind of took a look. But our roots are here, as you've heard. And so when this Revolution Mill property was presented to us, we were blown away. I mean, just to see the history and to know what it meant to Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, to see the buildings that look much like this and built in the 1890s as well, just was a, it was a perfect fit. And to be able to have space for the new for the new brewery, which is coming online next year, which would be 2018, um, it was it was just it was perfect. I mean, you just can't find a better area in a city that is going to allow for seven acres of um, of, of attachment brewery, you know, so we'll do the production, we'll have the, we'll have the uh, tasting room and the, the offices, but we'll also have about 60,000 square feet, square feet of outdoor space to allow for, for kind of the, the fun stuff to happen when we get that attachment. But prior to the brewery, we also, as part of this project, have opened um, a restaurant, a new concept restaurant uh, called Natty Green's Kitchen and Market. And to us, it's just the natural evolution of the brand. Um, in Greensboro, we haven't opened anything since 2004 on the restaurant side. We kind of snuck the production facility in in 2006. I think there's still that, you know, 90% of people in, in Greensboro, when they hear Natty Greens, they think about this location, rightfully so. But now what we're having is an evolution of the brand. So you're gonna see, you know, here we are, you know, 13 years later, and we are opening um, this, this location to just kind of showcase everything that we've learned 
uh, our understanding of where the industry is going and just a, just a new concept to an old area. And so that opened in July, uh, July 25th uh, of this year, 2017, with a, a unique concept. We're calling it the butcher and the baker and the beer maker. We're, we're, we're cutting everything in-house. We're baking everything in-house. And it, to me, it just goes hand-in-hand hand with handcrafted beer deserves handcrafted food and so this is this is the next step in the evolution getting us closer to the brewery so you've talked a lot about the physical locations here but you also have a pretty wide distribution range mm -hmm. so what is it like to have that kind of distribution yeah well um it's it's built the brand so distribution built the brand when chris and i started out we um with natty greens you know, our, our idea was if we were to distribute beer, which we did out of the gates, we distributed it to Old Town, First Street, and Tap Room, our, our draft houses. And that truly was the end of the business plan, end of the model. And um, that changed in 2005 when we signed a deal with the Greensboro Grasshoppers. And that really opened us up to a, just a whole different arena, no pun intended, to have people sampling our products. And that's when people started inquiring about, hey, can we get this? at our bar can I buy this at a grocery store so Chris and I um, took a hard look into that and before we made the decision to go into distribution which we did in 2000, late 2006 and 2007 by selling our three draft houses to former empl employees who still own them today to fund the brewery and so when we did that we were kind of all in on the distribution side we signed with um, some well, a local distributor which led us to North Carolina distributors um, to really get get the, the beer out there and in, in the course of doing that we have history all over us trains um, in the course in the course of doing that um, we transitioned from a local Greensboro product to a statewide brand that Greensboro could be proud of so distribution has played a huge huge part in this and it's it's you know, it's just it's it's part of it's part of the process now. It's part of the plan that um, runs hand in hand with bringing people back to our brew pub and to our um, to the kitchen and market and ultimately brewery to, to get that kind of that touch and feel of what they're pulling off the shelves or they're getting from their favorite you know local bar or restaurant. So it gives them kind of a, a face behind the behind the brand. How do you view your role in the community? Um, that's the first time really we've ever been asked that. Um, we just we just feel strong strongly about our community. I said that when we uh, opened this in 2004, we didn't do a demographic search or we didn't worry about. It. We just kind of wanted to do what we set out to do. Um, but in turn, we kind of took you know the first step into telling people it's okay to come downtown, letting the community know it's okay. And when that happened, that's when we realized that we had a little bit of an impact on the community and that we needed to get a little bit more involved. So over the course of the last 13 years, we have partnered up with local community charities and groups and um, you know, just kind of just doing our part to make sure that this, this community is known. I mean, you just see so many good things happening in other cities around our state. and. There's great things happening here, and we just want to make sure that uh, people kind of stop and explore. And the way we can do that is just by kind of you know alerting our community, whether it's through our brand or through other through other outlets. And so our community our community involvement didn't start out of the gates as as part of the plan, but it's it's very strong, and we feel like we're we're a big part of the community. But it's because of this community that we're we're who we are. Can you tell us a little more about some of the charitable events you have here, like Good Works Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, um, and that just that just parlays right into our partnerships. So we do a Good Works Wednesday every Wednesday, where ten percent of our proceeds go to a local charity. Um, it, it, it's really more for awareness um, to to you know help help them out, but also let people know. You know, for years we've been doing like community events, charitable events, and we just didn't say anything. We just we just did them. And this kind of gives it a showcase to where it opens the door for everybody, first of all, because you know you gotta be kind of careful when you start doing this because it opens Pandora's box and you can't do everything for it for all, but 
you can on Good Works Wednesday. So we do that. We have partnerships with the Humane Society and uh, United Way, and um, we'll continue to, 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 to go with those as we add other ones. But, um, yeah, for us it's just it's kind of what you do uh, when you're in a growing and part of a community. Where do you see the brewing industry going in the next five years? Um, I don't know where the brewing industry is going in the next year, but what I, what I can tell you is this, this is such a fast-moving industry, and what, what we've seen over the course of the last three years um, is this hyper-local approach where you're seeing now the breweries have transitioned, almost come full circle back to the brew pub mentality. That's kind of that attachment brewery where when we opened this in 2004, um, it was like, yeah, that's cool, but man, breweries are where it's going to be. And now here we are 13 years later where it's, it's kind of come back to where you've got a brew pub and a, a production facility all in one. So where I see it is, I see it being a very hyper-local approach. I see the, the breweries in our communities, in our community, as pretty much your neighbor, neighborhood tavern. It's, you wouldn't open a place today without having some type of brewing capacity within your facility, whether it's a one barrel, a seven barrel, or a 20 barrel. So I see it a uh, very hyper-local approach. I see a very communal approach, and I see it continuing to grow. What is your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than your own? Yeah, um, I like Foothills Hoppium. Um, they're good guys, and it's a great brew. Um, you know, I know that some people may disagree with me, but uh, there was a big splash made in Asheville when Sierra Nevada and New Belgium came um, because they are not part of North Carolina. Well, they certainly are part of North Carolina, and they validated our industry. So I've always been a fan of Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. I respect, uh, I respect their entire business growth from how they started and how they were the pioneers of this industry to today. And I also respect New Belgium. And so I like their Citradelic. So those would be the three that I like. I like the Hoppium, I like Sierra Nevada Classic Pale Ale, and I like uh, New Belgium Citradelic. The Tangerine Citradelic. Watermelon's a different story. <laughs> what is your favorite beer from Natty Greens? That would be our Southern Session IPA. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sessionable style. When we set out early on, uh, we had about three, which has grown to five core brands. And the, really the first, first three were Buckshot, it was Southern, and we had a Golden Ale. Um, but the Southern, the Southern is kind of our ode to Sierra Nevada and our respect to them. And so it was our attempt to have that style of beer. So that's my go-to, the Southern Session IPA.